Okay, lesson two. Um, let's see how we go. Um, I'm learning a lot as I go here, so you, uh, thank you for your continued patience. Um, we're going to talk about work um, today and how that relates to kinetic and potential energy. Um, we're going to do a bunch more questions in the class, and then they're, they're not too bad yet. They're, they're, they'll get fun. I promise you. That's my dog. Um, yeah, barking at nothing. Good, good. Okay, anyway, let's move on. Work. Let's just remind ourselves what we know about work. Work is a force times a distance. Uh, I've always got to do the same amount of work if, for example, I'm lifting an object. I can either apply a big force over a short distance or a smaller force over a bigger distance, but multiply those two numbers together, I've always got to do the same amount of work. Um, again, the unit is joules, what we call joules, because force um, is mass times acceleration kilogram meters per second squared times the extra meter, it's kilogram meter squared per second squared. We talked about that in the last lesson. It is a scalar quant uh, quantity. This is confusing because you can have a positive work or negative work. That's not referring to a direction. That is referring to if I am doing work on a system or if the system is in effect doing work on me. Um, and I think that's just something that's going to come clearer when we start doing problems a bit later on. OK, um, OK, let me just pause it here. Pause it as I go. Otherwise, I end up saying something stupid that's totally incorrect, and I have to go back and start all over again. At least this way, I only have to go back the uh, slide. All right, going fast. Um, let's talk about work and how it relates to motion. Now, we know work is a force times a distance. I'm going to kind of mathematically derive this uh, idea for us here. We know um, work is um, a force is mass times acceleration. Distance is uh, delta x, uh, uh, displacement in this case, uh, but for our argument, we can use them interchangeably. Now, this acceleration times delta x, we can actually do a bit of tweaking with an equation we know to get acceleration multiplied by delta x. And that's actually the time independent equation. V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2A delta x. Just trust me on this. What we're going to do is going to do a little bit of algebra, rearrange everything. So we now have a delta x equals v final squared minus v initial squared all over 2. And then um, what we're going to do is now we have a delta x equals all of this mess here. I'm going to go ahead and plug it into this equation right there. And what that leaves me with is work equals 1 half m v final squared minus 1 half m v initial squared. Why do we care about that? Well, actually, we're going to define this as something. This 1 half mv squared, we're going to call it a name. OK, so that 1 half mv squared thing, we're going to call it kinetic energy. And we're actually going to define it as 1 half mv squared. Now, why are we doing that? Well, if we define this whole idea as being kinetic energy, then if we go back here, what we have is we have, the, if the object in, in question uh, that is moving, if that has a constant mass, then right here we have the final kinetic energy, right here we have the initial kinetic energy, and because we got the final minus the initial, we're going to have the change in kinetic energy. And we tie all this together in something called the work kinetic energy theorem. It sounds very intimidating. Realistically, we don't use it that much. We just use it as a, a kind of stepping stone to, to get the knowledge we need to, to know um, now, this kinetic energy is going to have the exact same unit as work, right? It's going to have a mass of kilograms. The velocity is meters per second, but we're squaring it. So we still have the unit of joules, and it is still a scalar quantity. Um, just one interesting way of thinking about this um, is the fact that the velocity is squared. So even if I was to have a negative velocity, I'm squaring it, I'm going to end up with a positive number. My, my kinetic energy is always going to be positive. Um, so the work kinetic energy theorem, all that says is the amount of work you do on an object in a system is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. So work um, is uh, the change in kinetic energy, which is the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Um, and I'm just going to go back quickly. Once you've seen that, you're going to see that that's exactly what we just said there. Work equals the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. OK, so we're doing good. Uh, the only thing is I'm banding about this word energy. And what does energy mean? Um, I'm guessing you have a kind of intuitive idea of what energy means. Um, but in physics terms, here's how we're going to define it. We're going to define it as the ability to do work. 
What do I mean by that? Well, I'm actually going to just change on to the bigger camera here because I'm going to give you a quick example. It's my favorite example of this. I got a hammer and I got a nail, and I am, do not want to be hammering nails into my my um, guest bedroom's walls. But let's just say this is a wall and the nail there. If this hammer is moving then it has kinetic energy. If it has a velocity, it has kinetic energy. And if it has kinetic energy, by the time it hits this nail, all of that kinetic energy can be converted to do work because it's going to apply a force and it's going to push in that nail a certain distance. Let me say that again. If this hammer is moving, it has a velocity, it has kinetic energy. That kinetic energy can then be converted into work to be able to force this nail a certain distance. All right, let me pause it again. All right, yeah, so just to reiterate, energy is the ability to do work. Any kind of energy is the ability to do work. It can then apply a force over a certain distance. Kinetic energy, that's my favorite example, is the hammer there. Um, it's moving, and when it hits something, that can be converted to do work, to apply a force over a certain amount of distance. Um, but there's another type of energy, well, there's, there's multiple types of energy, ultimately, but there's another type of energy we want to really talk about right now, and that is um, Potential energy, uh, what we call gravitational potential energy. It only really matters if you have a gravitational field. Um, so at the end of the day, work is a force times a distance. Let, let's just do this a uh, couple of ways. If I get my hammer, let me just uh, adjust this. I get this hammer. I lift it off the desk here. I'm lifting it a certain distance, and I'm applying a force to lift it a certain distance. That force is then stored. And I can actually calculate it by mass times gravity times the height I've lifted it. But this is now stored as energy because although I did work to lift the hammer up, if I then let go of it, this hammer is going to do work by dropping down. And then if this hammer was to hit a nail, then again, it could apply a force over a certain distance and drive the nail into my nice little desk here. So I'm going to get the heavy objects away so I don't damage my desk. But um, that's the idea of potential energy. If I do work on something, I lift it up. I have then given it this energy that it has potential to do work now. Um, all it has to do is drop down and then it can apply a force over a certain distance. So that's what we call potential energy. We use U as a symbol for this and we calculate it by mass times gravity times height. <coughs> Um, one word of warning, I guess, uh, the way the equation is written in your formula sheets is actually delta U equals mg delta Y. And the reason is they, they consider it more of uh, the change in potential energy. And part of that has to do with um, what we call, uh, sorry, it's a scalar quantity again, the exact same thing, by the way, um, kilogram meters per second squared times a meter. So I'm going to get my kilogram meter squared per second squared. Um, but sorry, why is it delta? It's because we need a reference frame. And the reason is, OK, I live on the ground floor here. But if I lift my hammer off the table, let's say I've lifted this 20 centimeters. So I can then calculate the amount of energy it has uh, if it drops at 20 centimeters. But then what if I had actually lifted it off the floor? Um, then it's going to have a lot more potential energy. Even though it's at the same height I'm holding it, if it doesn't fall on the desk, it falls on the floor instead, it's going to have a lot more potential energy. So we need to set up our reference frame. And this is why they, one of the reasons why they really like to talk about the change in potential energy. Because pretty much wherever the object is, it has some degree of potential energy. It's only when you lift it, does that potential energy change. So you can measure the change in potential energy. And that, I think, is all I've got for you today. Um, let's just go over what did we talk about. We revised work. Work is force times distance, measured in joules, kilogram, meter squared per second squared. Joules is a much easier way of saying all that mess. And um, we talked about the work kinetic uh, theorem, kinetic energy theorem, that should say, I'm sorry, which is basically saying where the work, if I apply, if I do work on an object, it will change that object's kinetic energy. Uh, we talked about energy, which is just the ability to do work. If an object has energy, it can then use that energy to do work uh, in one way or another. And uh, potential energy, which is simply the energy an object has in a gravitational field, mass times gravity times height. That will do for now. The questions, uh, I haven't got any example questions for you. The, the, the questions I think you're going to be able to figure out in class. Um, and obviously, I'll be there to help you if you do get stuck. But that will do for now. Okay, thank you.